We are back, back and live and better than ever here in East Rutherford, New Jersey, after our two-week hiatus of live programs. But we'll be taking your phone calls today here on Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. We are so glad you could join us for today's program, and we do invite you to participate during the last 45 minutes or so. We will be taking your calls at 201-939-4513, 201-939-4513. As a reminder, you can always go to Twitter and go hashtag Giants Chat. And remember, you can find an archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and at Giants.com slash podcasts. Now, folks, you know we have already started previewing the Giants 2024 regular season opponents. Well, today's no different. Even though we are back live and we will take your phone calls, the beginning of the show, well, we're going to go to one of the Giants opponents. Makes a lot of sense, right? And we talk about the Atlanta Falcons with hometown Brandon Leak. From 680, The Fan, down in Atlanta. He's a co-host of the morning show down there and a longtime Falcons follower and observer. Brandon, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Anytime, Paul. Thanks for having me. Well, I got to tell you, I don't know what in the world you folks down in the southeast did to send up that heat and humidity here to the northeast, but we've been getting roasted like a microwave for the last couple of weeks. I, I don't know how in the world you guys deal with that. We had a breezy 89 uh, early last week, and I think that's the coolest we're going to see it until the fall, deep into the fall around these parts. All right, so the Giants will be uh, playing the Falcons. Well, it's unfortunately very, very late in the schedule. It'll be on December 22nd. That's a 1 o'clock game in Atlanta. So the Giants will be heading down to the nest for that ball game. And, look, I, I, I would assume that Kirk Cousins is going to be healthy throughout the course of the season. So let's just start there because he was the biggest free agent signing of all the names that we heard about during the offseason as he signs that big contract to head to Atlanta after a stellar career in Minnesota that never provided the promised championship that he was supposed to deliver them. So what makes people in the in Falcons country think he can help them deliver it there? Well, I think most people think that he is now on a better team. While he did have some nice offensive weaponry uh, in certain positions, particularly with Justin Jefferson, that the Falcons' overall team, as they are constructed now, it's better than the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings had a horrid defense last year, and the Falcons, believe it or not, finished up with the top 10 ranked defense in the NFL last year, and that was with horrid quarterback play from, you know, a guy who really is a backup in Desmond Ritter. And so when you look at what the Falcons have done, the DNA and the groundwork built to this moment, for this moment, has come the last few years when they've had three first-round picks in the top ten with Bajon Robinson, with Drake London, and with Kyle Pitts that when the games open up week one, and Kirk Cousins is under center for the Falcons. He will have some places to go and some weaponry to use that he has not had in Minnesota with a defense that's already better than what he's leaving coming in at 36 years old. All right. We know about what happened with the Achilles injury last year. From what you understand, uh, how are systems going right now? Are they green? And if so, uh, how much work has he been able to get in as he tries to acclimate himself? Falcons have been really honest about that, and he is currently on schedule. Now, on schedule, you know, means around, when you talk about the time frame of his Achilles healing and the entirety of the process, you're still talking about around preseason for him to be completely healed through the timeline. But uh, he got to uh, minicamp pretty early. He went to uh, non-mandatory events and got himself acclimated with his wide receiver. So everything looks like it's going to be all systems go and the question will be, how much time does he see in the preseason? Do they want to get him out and get some live action against uh, some really, uh, you know, some defenses trying to really take him down to the ground? And that's the big question. When does he take his first hit in a Falcon uniform? Sure. But he does need to get timing. He does need to get rhythm. And he does need to figure out how to use some big wide receivers. When you're talking about a 6'4", Drake London, and a 6'6", Kyle Pitts. So you got the quarterback in waiting in drafting Michael Penix obviously in the first round. Everybody knows about these QBs when they get picked right in that first round. And Taylor Heineke, I suppose, 
unless you tell me something otherwise, will start the season as the number two, will he not? I think he will officially, but we know we're going to see Michael Penix Jr. in some preseason games. Mm -hmm. So the question will be, uh, when does that happen? Uh, What needs to happen as far as salary cap flexibility? Uh, Taylor Heineke is not an expensive option, but when you have Michael Penix Jr., a first-round pick, uh, sitting there. And the other thing is, he's an older player. Michael Penix isn't a 21-year-old. You're talking about a guy who uh, spent six years in college because of both uh, ACLs that he blew out. Uh, he's a he's an older quarterback coming out, so I think if he can prove that he is uh, trustworthy, because at some point he will be the number two, and uh, if he proves that he's trustworthy early, it, it'll be interesting to see how long Taylor Heineke remains on this roster. But I agree with you to start the season first preseason game. You got to think you'll have a veteran quarterback that's been out on the field that has won games in the NFL. Got some talented skill position players there in Robinson and Pitts and London. Uh, Certainly no question about some of the weaponry, but I want to go to Pitts for a second. I remember when he came out in the draft a couple years back, everybody was like, oh my God, this guy is like all universe at tight end. Now, you can tell me from watching him week to week and snap to snap if he is even close to fulfilling the expectations. I will only say this. From being a far-reaching observer, uh, we don't get to see Falcons football very much, obviously, here in New York. It doesn't seem like he has lived up to his billing to this point. Am I right? Am I wrong? If I'm right, how far off is he? And does Cousins bring out the best in him? No, you're spot on with that. The question, though, is why? Is it because... He has not panned out. He is not exactly what they thought he was. Remember, when he was coming out of the University of Florida, he was considered to be a unicorn. Look at this guy. He's tight end. He's 6'6". Well, he has an interesting narrative in that his first year was the last year with Matt Ryan, the franchise all-time leading quarterback, and he was a few yards away from breaking a 60-year-old tight end record held by Mike Ditka his first year when he went over 1,000 yards receiving. Enter his second year, and... You know, a quarter of the way through, he blows out his knee. He comes back last year, and it just didn't look right. I remember we got to training camp last year, and he had the biggest knee brace I have ever seen. Paul, it looked like it was a knee brace for two people that he shoved his leg into, and we were like, what in the world? He was supposed to have surgery. He was supposed to have recovered. And, you know, I guess the Falcons did what was supposed to be uh, the right thing to do as far as the rules, but he clearly did not look right. He had a, a little gate uh, to his uh, giddy-up last year, but had a chance with our morning show down here in Atlanta, the locker room earlier this year. We went and um, covered one of his uh, charity events at a uh, golf outing, and we got a chance to physically look at him, and he was not, he had no lift. He had nothing going on, and he looked like maybe whatever was going on, it may have taken two years to get ready. So the question mm. is, has he had unfulfilled expectations because of the injury Plus, you throw in before Desmond Ritter, there was the, I call it the lost season with Marcus Mariota, who yeah. quit on the team uh, week 12 when he was told he was not going to be the starter anymore and he was going to have to be a backup to Desmond Ritter. He quit, went to Hawaii, and spent the rest of the season with his wife as he had surgery to uh, finish up his Falcon career, which he could have had after the season but chose to have it the last four weeks. So he's played with one year of Matt Ryan. 1,000-plus yard, almost uh, broke a record season. Comes in with Marcus Mariota, blows out his knee. Then he has Desmond Ritter, who is a backup quarterback. And now he has Turk Cousins. I think there is a big ceiling and a big potential for, for Kyle Pitts to achieve if he's healthy and this offensive line does a lot of what people think it will be able to do. Well, we'll talk about that line in a second. Obviously, Cousins needs the protection to get the ball to London and more and Pitts and some of these other guys. But I want to go to B. John Robinson, a guy who had been hurt in college, but last year had nearly 1,000 yards as, as one of the NFL's star rookies in the game. Can you give me an indication as to what they think his upside will be as a sophomore pro? Yeah, maybe a top three top two running back in the NFL. I mean, this guy, if he is out there, he is slippery. He can hit the hole. He can catch the ball. He has explosiveness, and that's something that the Falcons have not had 
in quite a few years at a, at a couple of positions, but typically at running back, you do have one explosive back, even if he's your change of pace back. And with him being RB1, he is a dangerous individual. He did get uh, many more targets than a lot of people thought he was going to get. He got 86 targets his rookie year last year, and that was with Desmond Ritter. And obviously, we have a quarterback that is challenged throwing the ball down the field, having a safety valve like Bajon Robinson uh, is certainly helpful. And he had an opportunity to do more. There was a strange game in Tampa where the Falcons were actually fined for it, where he was not made available to play. He was not on the injury report uh, going into the weekend. He did not play. And then in the fourth quarter, when the game was winding down, he got into the ball game and just really came in as a blocker. So really, he got in the game, but he didn't play that much. And that really was a game. He would have had more targets. He would have had more yards. And this guy is explosive. He could hit the hole. He looks like he could be really, really dangerous when you get to the red zone as he's a guy who can split out and make linebackers miss. So uh, there, there are high expectations, high hopes, and a lot of excitement around the John Robinson, hopefully being one of the best running backs and best young running backs in the National Football League. Well, the Falcons certainly have some guys on the offensive line who can make those things happen for those skill guys. Look, I liked McGarry when he was coming out of Washington, but the one who intrigues me is the Iron Man, the old horse who seems to never get old in Jake Matthews. How high a level can he continue to play at at this stage of his career? He's been around forever. Yeah, he's one of those guys. He's exactly what you need an offensive lineman to be. He's somebody you know he's there, but you don't have to call his name. And uh, he really has been an anchor for this team. And if you really think to the, the, the previous, previous conversation, what he's had to be a part of, he's had to witness the heyday of Matt Ryan, uh, the let's wait and see what's going on with Marcus Mariota. That didn't work out. The disaster that was Desmond Ritter, and now – He's got Kirk Cousins coming in. He has had to really teach and do a lot of extra outside of his positions when you're talking about uh, having a situation where the left guard had to be taught. So when you're talking about being a veteran offensive lineman and then you have to show the guy right next to you and teach some things and get the communication uh, with the guy next to you as an extra part of your job, this, this guy really has been solid and we're hopeful a lot of people are hopeful down here that the Falcons will have him and this offensive line not only run, they did a very good job of run blocking. The question will be, can they pass block at an elite level for 17 weeks for a quarterback like Kirk Cousins, who will not leave the pocket unless he absolutely right. has to, and he's coming off of an injury. I think you guys have the fountain of youth down there. I remember Mike Ken, and I remember Jeff Van Note, who two, two guys were like <laughs> Methuselah's relatives right? They, they just never seem to retire. In fact, I still think those guys are playing for God's sakes. And here's Matthew who's following in their footsteps. I don't know how in the world the Falcons do it, but they hold on to these quality linemen forever. It's amazing. It really is. Yeah, you look at you know, Noter was one of the all-timers as uh, they say he's a genius, that he has a photographic memory. You know, having guys like that who are lo- around for a long time you know, back in the 90s, they had a big – like I played with, with you guys when you're talking about Big Bob Whitfield. Sure. He was one of those uh, mountains of a man that could really be counted on and beat people up. And, you know, that is yet to be seen. You can be a good and physical run team. You can do a solid job in the passing game. But can you beat people up and beat different types of defenses, uh, defenses and people up? That is yet to be seen. But – uh Certainly, if that is going to be part of the case, then you're going to need a veteran offensive lineman to be a part of that, lead the way, and show it by not giving up stats or some whips on your quarterback when you have key moments in game. You got another gray beard and Grady Jarrett over on the defensive line. David Onyemata coming over from the Saints, who I thought was an underrated player when he was in New Orleans. That's your beef up front. And then the linebacking core has an old familiar face who signed with you guys down in Atlanta a couple years ago from the Giants, Lorenzo Carter. How about uh, giving us a little bit of a thumbnail as to what you expect out of the front seven this year? Yeah, Zoe Carter, also a UGA Bulldog. So he's big (laughs) and well-respected down these parts. You know, with the selection of Michael Penix Jr., it tipped the hand of the Falcons. It was, you know, you had an opportunity uh, maybe to get yourself an edge rusher or another big fella early, and when you went quarterback, you decided to go with the beef that you had. So you mentioned Grady Jarrett, and there are some big fellas, Contavia Street, uh, they picked up last year from uh, the Eagles. They draft Rook Aroro Row 
uh, big fella. He looks like Grady Jarrett a little bit out of Clemson. Uh-huh. And then you mentioned Anyamata, who is a uh, beast, and he always goes for it. They also have a big fella named Taquan Graham, and then they drafted Brandon Doralis this year. So the front seven is going to be a rotation. I think that will probably be the more settling unit. The question will be the linebacking core, because they're going to go from – a traditional 4-3 to more of a 3-4. They'll be hybrid, and they always play multiple, like most guys say. Uh, but they're going to go to a 3-4. So we have Lorenzo Carter, and they get Braylon Trice out of Washington, who is a athletic-looking linebacker, uh, 6-3, 240, 245. Then you throw in Caden Ellis, who came over from the Saints. So they do have some veterans mixed in with some young guys. Troy Anderson was their first-round pick two years ago, and he left with a pectoral injury. So... The linebacking position is the biggest question mark, I think. If you had to rate the Falcons, it would be linebacker, question mark, number one, defensive back, question mark, number two, and you're probably most solid up front with the biggins with your defensive linemen. Yeah, see, I was going to say to you from afar, I'm thinking the secondary right now seems to be kind of shaky for me. Certainly not a lot of household names back there at all. No, no, no. A.J. Terrell has been there the longest, and look, he's, He is a solid cornerback. He is not one of your – I would not put him in the elite category where you don't throw that side of of the field or else you're going to be in big trouble. Uh, But he is a guy – I think the biggest part of his game, if the Falcons have a pass rush, like most defensive backs, he's better. Uh, They hit a home run last year uh, with Jesse Bates, the third, coming out of Cincinnati. He was a free agent. He was their big fish last year. Ended up being a pro bowler and really making a difference. But you're right. It is a, a piece of together situation with their cornerbacks and safety. They drafted Richie Grant, and this is a kind of show-me gear if he makes the team. DeMarco Hellams was a the guy they brought in last year. Mike Hughes is a veteran, and Kevin King. So they will not have household names in the back of the secondary. And I think if they do become noteworthy and they do become guys that uh, make some noise and get some production, it will be because – of the heat they get from Lorenzo Carter and Braylon Trice and Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata up front. And I think those guys will be the beneficiaries of really a front seven that helps them out until they figure out what kind of talent they can get in that is elite down the road. Well, I'll tell you what, I appreciate the fact that that game will be inside on December 22nd. We don't have to worry about the cold in Atlanta. <laughs> it will be 72 degrees, I can promise you that, Paul. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to hold you to that. Home team Brandon Leak <laughs> from the fan, 680 in Atlanta, giving us the lowdown on the Atlanta Falcons, a team that will play the Giants later on during the course of the 2024 season. Thank you so much for joining us today, Brandon. Be well. Anytime. Have me anytime you can, sir. All right. Appreciate it. 201-939-4513. So the Falcons, check that box off on our opponent's previews as we continue to go through the 2024 Giants schedule. On tomorrow's program, that would be Tuesday, if you're listening on the archive, just to make sure you got the day straight, we're going to try to track down somebody from the Indianapolis Colts, another one of the Giants' foes during this upcoming season. Folks, remember, as we uh, go through some of our promos, the Run or Walk with Giants Legends event. We keep talking about that. Well, it's coming up soon. The Giants Foundation will host a 5K race and kids run presented by Quest that Saturday, September 7th at 9 a.m. at MetLife Stadium. Net proceeds will benefit the Giants Foundation. All participants will receive a commemorative T-shirt. And after the race, stay for a post-race festival and appearances by Giants legends and a live DJ. Register now at Giants.com slash 5K. Also, remember to subscribe to the Giants Huddle podcast. Long-form interviews with Giants and NFL personnel. Uh, You can find it on your favorite podcast platform or go to Giants.com slash podcasts. And don't forget, if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave a positive review. It helps us with the ratings and lets us know that you like the program. And Giants season ticket memberships are available uh, for the 2024 season. You get exclusive member benefits year-round. To learn more all about those, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available, and the Giants official connected TV streaming app is Giants TV. Uh, It's free on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. One final note to bring you, and that is Giants training camp practices are free and open to the public beginning on the 24th of July. However, 
All of the free tickets that were distributed through the Internet site have been claimed. So it is a sellout. Perhaps you've got some friends or family who can't use their tickets and will send them off to you as a, as a nice gesture of goodwill. Or perhaps they just uh, can't, you know, just want to bring you along or just let you go for whatever the reason. Uh, but there are no more tickets available. I remember when we were still live two weeks ago, we were telling you folks about that. And everybody hopped on the Internet and they scapped up those tickets like hotcakes at that a pancake house. And so they are all gone and I, I apologize. There's only so many stands that they can put up outside the facility. Uh, they have sold out all of the tickets for Giants training camp. So now that we've got that stuff out of the way, the rest of the show is up to you folks at 201-939-4513. 201-939-4513 here on Big Blue Kickoff Live. We go to Greg in Atlanta. How about that? We're staying in Georgia for the first call of the program. Hello, you're first on the program. Hey, how you doing, Paul? Good to talk to you. How are you? All right. I haven't called in a while, man. But I'm calling now because just to give my opinion on the upcoming season a little bit, if I may. Sure. Um, and um, let me start off by saying I am a Daniel Jones fan, but – I really kind of feel like, you know, we did not make a good move this year by not preparing for uh, our future at quarterback. I just feel like I, I, I just heard an article where uh, just listened to a thing with Patrick Peterson made a negative remark about Daniel Jones and <laughs> how he feel like Daniel Jones uh, can't read defenses. And the only reason I'm bringing it up because – that's what I've been telling my friends the last couple of years, just looking at him and how jittery he is. I understand our offensive line hasn't quite been what it should be, but just looking at how Daniel Jones sometimes take off, you know, before, it just seems like he's not comfortable yeah. with Hanging in the pocket. You you wouldn't be, be a you, problem this year. You wouldn't be comfortable in the pocket if you were feeling as much pressure as a pressure cooker back there either. I don't think there's any doubt that Daniel Jones was impacted by the very, very substandard play, and I'm gonna use a very nice term, say substandard. It was flat out bad. Okay. The the pressure on the quarterback last season, even before Daniel Jones was injured was way, way, way too much. And I absolutely believe that he was impacted by that. So the question becomes, can he recover from that once he gets behind this new offensive line as they tinker with the offense and they hope that these guys can give them improved play? Will Daniel Jones go back to the guy that he was two years ago and still show you an upward trend or yeah. is he going to wind up being so significantly damaged by what happened during the first half of last season that he'll never be the guy to fulfill his potential? That That is an unknown. That's an unknown. And you're right yeah. and fair to question it. I tend to lean to the fact that he's going to be okay. But that's simply that's simply an opinion that nobody has to share if they don't want to. I think the fairest thing to do is say, let's wait and see. Let's let him get out there, right? Let him get out there under these new circumstances and see what happens. If he's good, then say he's good. If he's not good, then say he's not good. I would only add one yeah. other item to your comment, and that is, and I know a lot of people have been talking about this on the Internet, about Patrick Peterson, who was most recently with the Vikings, and I believe he's with the Steelers now. Uh, yeah, he popped his mouth off. I don't know when that came from. I don't know the date and the context of his comments. But I do know this. Daniel Jones really gave the Vikings an absolute mammoth headache. Not only in the regular season game they played in Minnesota in 2022. In the game but then well. he beat them in the playoff game. Okay? Yeah. And both times, you know, he led the Giants from behind and, and made those Vikings fans absolutely bonkers. Uh, as he was basically shredding their secondary as if, uh, you know, he was a, a paper shredder. So yeah. I I don't understand. Again, I'm not going to criticize Peterson because I don't know the context or the timing of his comments. 
but it sure does sound awfully funny after what he did to the Vikings in 2022. I agree. Well, that's all I really wanted to say, man. I listen all the time, and thank you, guys, and let me let some other callers get in. Hey, great for the call. Thank you so much, and please give us a call back, Greg. 201-939-4513. Phone lines are open. I know you folks have been itching to get on the line, so please, this is your opportunity. Remember, the Giants rookies will actually be reporting to the facility tomorrow. They'll get their uh, check-ins and their conditioning tests. They get to come in a week before the veterans. The veterans will have their first practice on Wednesday the 24th. You guys already know if you have tickets, that's a, that's a, a practice that you can come and see. But the rookies are allowed to come in tomorrow. They'll check in here and uh, they'll get their physicals and get all their stuff and their gear together, go through some meetings, and uh, they get a little bit of a head jump on the vets who don't get to come in uh, until next week. 201-939-4513 is our phone number. Let's go to Cliff on line two. You're next on BBKL. Hello. Hey, Paul. Hey, Hi. Thanks a lot for those those shows last week, man. You kept me engaged with those previews. Oh, appreciate it very much. We, we figured, you know, uh, as long as the holiday season was here and a lot of people may or may not be around, want to make phone calls, or we certainly had staff here who wanted some time off, we figured if we got those previews in the can, we'd give you something to keep you occupied. <laughs> yeah, well, it worked for this guy. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Listen, I, I wanted to ask you about what you think uh, Dable meant when he made a certain comment uh, recently. But before I get to that, uh, I, I was wondering about Saquon for years, and I never really checked into it yeah. in terms of, you know, when I heard he was from the Bronx, I assumed he was really from the Bronx. And I finally checked into it. He's four years old when he leaves the Bronx, man. Right. And, he, and, and the family moves to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, you know, yeah. the famous steel town in the Lehigh Valley, mm -hmm. which is where the Eagles, which is where the Eagles were training, not necessarily in that town, but, you know, not, know. not far from there. And and uh, and Allentown is not far from there, and it's like thirty or forty miles, you know, north of Philly. So it, it's not like he was a Philly guy, but he's a huge Eastern Pennsylvania guy, and and he was really popular in high school. And he, when he goes to Penn State, I didn't realize he reneged on Rutgers first, and then he goes to Penn State. And the most striking thing was when I would talk to Eagles fans the last few years, they would you know trash everybody on any other team, including ours, but never him. They always talked about loving him, and it was very striking. Well, Cliff, that, that he did a lot of charity out there, too. If you followed his, his career path, not only to Penn State, but then even to the Giants, he always gave back to some of those folks, not only here in the New York metropolitan area, but gave back to those youths in Pennsylvania as well. I mean, he, uh -huh. he was a very generous athlete as he continued to progress. He never forgot. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that made him the class guy that he was. Absolutely. But I think it's one of the things that made him sign with the Eagles. <laughs> I'm I mean, not, I, I'm, I can't tell you how much of a percentage was involved in that, but I'll say this. Don't you find it kind of odd that there were rumors there'd be a heavy market for him and there were four or five other teams that were supposedly playoff contenders that we heard they had cap room and they were going to make a heavy pitch for Barkley. Well, if that was true, right? then why wouldn't his agent have held on to Barkley for a little while and tried to negotiate and tried to use those teams as leverage and get an even better deal? I say, the reason, right. I say the reason is because the deal that the Eagles gave him was so outlandish. It was so out of this world that Barkley and his people knew they weren't going to get another deal like that, so they jumped on it right away before it disappeared. Philadelphia okay. did not make a good business decision. They're rolling the dice. They're taking a risk that he's going to be healthy for at least a year, maybe two, and that he can get them to the Super Bowl because he's an incredible talent. And I will never, ever dispute his talent. The guy is one of the best three running backs in the National Football League in terms of all-around ability. But because of the durability factor, and the continuing injury problems that have plagued him throughout, that's what makes him a bad financial risk when you put the kind of money on the table that the Eagles did. And I think him and his people knew they were not going to get 
another large number akin to that one in the depressed running back market. And that is why they signed with the Eagles in a heartbeat. I do think there had to be some of the Philadelphia flavor in there in that you're right. He's got a lot of background in Pennsylvania. I'm sure that was just a little icing on the cake. But look, the way I see it, Saquon Barkley was going to go where the money was. He was going to take the top dollar. He wasn't going anywhere else except those who were going to give him the most money. And he did. Well, I, I, that, that, that's helpful. I, I, I'm sure the business part was primary. But uh, the bottom line was, uh, you know, we didn't lose him. He, he went. No, know? no question. Because, see, Joe Shane put him on the spot. And that's the other thing. I haven't talked about Hard Knocks at all, which, of course, it has its third episode coming up tomorrow. Let me just say this to you, Cliff. If you saw the show, and I'm guessing you did, yes? A little bit. I okay. saw highlights. At one point, and, I, and I'm and i the first one to say you got to be careful about taking quotes. Even in these video shows, stuff can still be edited and taken out of context. So I'm very quick to say you need to understand context. But I also think it is very telling. Joe Shane and this organization did want Saquon Barkley back. They knew how talented that he is. There's no doubt about that. But Joe Shane wanted him back at a price that he thought made business sense, given his injury history and his age. And if you listen to Joe with Saquon on the phone during one of the Hard Knocks episodes, you know, basically what Joe did he put the ball in Saquon's court. Barkley, yes. for a year and a half, kept preaching, I want to be a lifetime giant. I never want to leave. I want to see my name up here in the ring of honor. I want to be one of the guys who turns the Giants franchise around. Well, to my way of thinking, Joe asked Barkley to put his money where his mouth was. Oh, yeah? You really feel that way about the Giants? Well, we don't have the kind of numbers and the kind of money to afford under the cap to be outlandish and pay you crazy numbers. So you're going to have to take what we can afford and show us that you really want to be here. And Barkley right, gave and you that, he gave you his answer when he decided to go to Philadelphia and take the gold. Right, and just to finish that up, I'm glad you said a year and a half because I thought it affected both contracts, including the one that ended up being the franchise last year. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really do. Well, anyway... Uh, I want to ask you about the Dable thing, and I'll, I'll take it off the air. Uh, it was either in Hard Knocks or, um, or uh, uh, during the 100th anniversary celebration, there was a quote from Dable, you know, in a video that um, we're still building our team. We, we still don't have our team yet. We're still adding pieces. And I just wondered if you had a take on what pieces those were. Well, I mean, if you look at it, Cliff, and thanks for the phone call. Folks, we have lines open at 201-939-4513. If you look at the roster, and we, we've talked about this for several months, that going into the offseason, the Giants, it seemed to me, needed help on the offensive line. They needed some more uh, depth at corner, proven depth at corner is what I should say. And they also needed another pass rusher. Well, look, they signed two veteran offensive linemen in Illuminor and Runyon. Now, these guys are solid, steady, sturdy NFL starters. Neither one's a superstar. Neither one's going to the Pro Bowl, okay? We don't, we don't want to, you know, sugarcoat that. But these guys are good, established NFL starters. But behind them, let's not kid ourselves, folks, there's still a lot of question marks. And all it's going to take is one key injury on that offensive line, and now you're having to elevate question marks into the starting lineup, right? I mean, you don't really need to be a genius to figure it out. Just look at the depth chart between the young guys who are injured, right, in McKeithen and in, in, um, in Azudu. Uh, look at some of the, the other veterans, a Slotman, uh, who, you know, he has a limited NFL resume. He's your backup center right now. I mean, you look at your your third tackle. I mean, I know you could move a Luminor out there if you have to and then just plug in one of the other guards inside, but that involves two moves instead of only one. So, you know, what, what are you going to do with your third tackle right now? Uh, it would seem to me, and, and I know he was nicked up during the spring, but Matt Nelson, 
you know, the former Lion seems to be at the moment a guy who would be heavily in the running to be the third tackle unless they did decide to play musical chairs with Illuminor. I mean, we're not talking about a tremendous amount of proven commodities here. So depth-wise, I think it's safe to say the Giants think they've got a solid foundational starting five. But once you get into that depth chart on the offensive line, I, I think it's it's unproven. There's a bunch of question marks there. So I, I think they've helped themselves, but are they on concrete ground? I think it's still wait and see. As far as the corners go, well, they got numbers. And I think we would all agree they have numbers. We know Banks is going to start on one side. I'm a big Cordell Flott guy, but even I have to admit, while I love, love his attitude and think he has the ability to, to shine as a boundary corner, he's still relatively unproven. So you've got McLeod, you've got Hawkins, you got Herndon. You know, Drew Phillips was drafted in the third round out of Kentucky, but excuse me, they expect him to be a slot guy and compete in the slot. So you have a bunch of unproven guys, but at least potential answers at the corner opposite Banks. Would I feel better if there was a more proven guy there? I suppose I would. You know, I, I had been saying it for a couple of months. I, I might think about Akello Witherspoon, right, from the, the former uh, Ram, the free agent. Big, tall, six foot plus, six foot two plus corner. Uh, I suggested him while he was out on the street. Because it seems to me that, you know, I would probably feel more comfortable if I could have a veteran corner with a long established pro resume to not only help out some of those guys, but maybe actually play if he needed to. I mean, kind of like when they had Fabian Moreau a couple of years ago. And he helped get him to the playoffs. So so that's probably, you know, still in my mind, an area that I'm kind of still looking at out of the corner of my eye. Pass rusher-wise, well, we know what they did. They went and they got Brian Burns. Burns, Thibodeau, uh, Ojolari, Taman Fox. Those, those, those are your four guys, you know, right now. Uh, as as the stand up outside linebackers or edge rushers, if you will, that that's what if you're going four deep, those are the four deep you're going. Um, you know, would you love to have had another one? Well, that's probably a luxury, right? Because it costs an awful lot of money to get one of those guys. Uh, very very difficult. So you're going to have to hope that either Ojolari stays healthy and is more efficient this year than he was last year, if he's going to at least play in a rotation. Or you hope that Tamon Fox takes a step up because he certainly showed some things, you know, as a rookie. But can he step up to another level? And who knows, maybe unseat Ojolari? I don't know the answer to that. That's still a question. So for me, for me, those are the three areas that I went into during the offseason saying, what are the Giants going to do? And I think they've got enough to be okay. But if injuries strike any of those positions, it could get real sticky in a hurry. The other spot that I would warn you about is the power running back spot. I've always said I prefer to have a power running back uh, in that room. Someone who is going to push the pile that extra yard and a half on a third and two to make sure he gets it if the offensive line doesn't give him enough room to run. Giants don't really have one of those guys. Yes, Singletary does run between the tackles. He is an inside runner. But I just don't see him as someone who's going to push the pile in a really tightly congested situation where if the line doesn't make the block and there's bodies all over the place and they're pushing against him, I I don't necessarily have a ton of confidence that he's going to push that pile and get that first down or cross that goal line. So I'd love to see them maybe add a power back. Um, that That's the other one that, you know, kind of gives me a little bit of a yellow flag as I get ready for training camp. 
201-939-4513. Phone lines are open. We've got about 20 minutes left on the show. Tony is in Las Vegas, and he's next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello, Tony. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Good, good. Glad to see you guys are back. It is wonderful to be back. Trust me. Yeah. So anyway, what happened to Lance? I, you know what? I don't know where, where Lance is these days. Uh, I, I've talked to him a couple weeks back, but I haven't talked to him recently. So just check on his uh, on his Twitter page. I know he, he accepts messages. You can reach out to him there and ask him yourself. All right. Very good. And um, for once, I want to call you guys and say, and I thought our general manager made a big mistake not picking up the fifth year on Daniels. Well... Uh, let's put it this way. If you reverse the calendar and you go back to when uh, Daniel Jones, you know, was in a position to be optioned by the team, they looked at it and they decided that based on his injury history, you know what? They were better off not doing it. Well, history proved it otherwise. Well, that's but that's always easy, you know. Hindsight, what they tell you, it's always twenty twenty. Hey, I, I always I'm the hindsight guy. <laughs> okay, and that's fair. I love the <laughs> fact that you admit to that because most people who criticize using hindsight won't admit that they're twenty twenty guys and that they will look at it from the reverse angle. So I appreciate right. that you admit to that because that's oh, absolutely. That, it's a, it's well, not it's a, been better off. Well, it's an unfair well, way to look at it. It hurt so much last year. Right. I understand. You know, I understand. It's been a much easier contract than we could have probably drafted somebody. Well, no, and and again, I I appreciate the fact that you admit to to looking at it that way because most people won't. See, I've always been of the understanding from a business perspective because I always put my 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 head in the head of the head coach and the general manager when there is a particular decision that has to be made. Because I think that is the most reasonable and logical way to formulate an analysis or an opinion. But to do that, you have to go back, flip the calendar, and say, well, at the time the decision was being made, when these options were on the table, what made the most sense and why? And what were the other reasonable or logical options at the time? And that is how I grade a decision. I never right. grade it in hindsight because, quite frankly, I, I think that's unfair. But at least you, you have admitted that that's the way you're going to grade it. So I'm okay with that. We can agree to disagree, but I can respect the fact that you accept the way you're looking at it is out of a warped lens. Right. But the key was is they didn't dress a quarterback when they turned it down. So they could have had him at a decent price, and then he had a great year. But when well, he was coming up for a contract, he had a terrible year. Who did you want to take? I mean, again, let, let's try uh, to flip the know. calendar. I don't know. I'm not that smart. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. okay. I can only say we didn't dress a quarterback. I, and, and I and I I do I I do understand. You know they they signed Tyrod Taylor, uh, you know, and, and he was here for a short while. They they drafted Tommy DeVito as a project, and you know didn't draft Tommy. Tommy was an undrafted rookie free agent, and Tommy came in and proved that he could win some games. So now they've decided that Drew Locke is the insurance policy, and he's still pretty young. You know, Drew Locke's. Oh, I know he is. He's only been in this league a handful of years. I mean. I truly believe, and they basically have told you as much, when they signed Drew Locke, I told you guys on this program that he's the insurance policy and there is no longer a great importance on trying to draft one. And that's exactly what's played out. They did due diligence and checked in with the Patriots to see if the Patriots were going to move out and that's fine. You have to do due diligence. Every GM needs to do that. If you know that there's going to be or the possibility of a pick that's very high that might be dangled out on the trade market, you have to do due diligence, make a phone call and say, hey, if you're going to move that pick, uh, let me know what the price is. We should at least know. You have to do that. So that's what the Giants did. But clearly they were not desperate to go after a quarterback because they believe 
that Drew Locke is an adequate insurance policy. Well, and I, I think so, too. This past year, I was talking about back when they didn't pick up his right. option. Well, that's water under the bridge. That's kind of too late at this point. I know. I, but you know. I've been for the last year, want to call and give my viewpoint on it. That's okay. You know my first game that I ever went to? What's that, sir? Was the uh, championship game against Baltimore. So, so Tony, we talk, we're talking 15, the one at Municipal Stadium. It was a giant, no, yeah, giant stadium. No, well, one yeah, of my suppliers, I the, was 19 the, years old and all right. purchasing stuff. In he 15? Says, you want to go to the game? I said, what game? Giants against the Colts. I went. All right, now in and 50. Next year I became a season ticket holder, and I was for 40 years. Oh, that's awesome. Now, in 58, yeah. the Colts beat the Giants in the greatest game ever played, the 58 championship game in overtime. Right. That's the game you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. In 59, they had a rematch in the championship game against the Colts down in Baltimore at Municipal Stadium, and the Colts ran away with the game. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks you for the call, Tony. <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Keep enjoying uh, Giants football. 201-939-4513. Hard knocks. Uh, I'm glad that uh, we had a chance to, during conversation, to bring that up. Hard knocks off season is now two shows in. Uh, show number three will be coming up uh, tomorrow night. It's on HBO Max. And by the way, folks, there was a lot of confusion when that show came on a couple of weeks ago. Pearson, did you try to did you try to check it out that first time when it was on two weeks ago? Because if people went to HBO instead of HBO Max, they had to wait, or at least I thought they had to wait because it was listed as ten o'clock on HBO Max, and it actually came on the stream on uh, no, it was listed as ten o'clock on HBO on FiOS, but it actually wound up going on max on the stream at nine and then as i was later told afterwards hbo interrupted their regular programming at nine i guess it was a show or a movie and they wound up showing the program at nine on hbo anyway did you did you uh, i you did not know that i watched it the next day so i wasn't sure uh, what it, but okay. yeah it should be on both <laughs> well that's good because you saved yourself a headache of trying to figure out where it was going to be. It's very true. Well, here's what I did for show two, just to make sure that I had it right, because I originally was going to watch it uh, on on HBO uh, at nine at nine o'clock on the first Tuesday, and then when I'm I'm watching in the first 15, 30 seconds, whatever it was, and the show wasn't there, I immediately went to the stream to max. Just panicked. <laughs> I panicked, and I and I I got the stream up and I I watched it on max. There you go. And then last week, I figured I'm not jerking around with with the -the over-the-air based on the Files television schedule. I'm just going right to the stream and HBO Max, and I watched it at 9 o'clock, and it was fine. Glad you figured it out. Uh, Important (laughs) to figure these things. And I didn't even have you with me. I know. All by yourself, you did it. He, uh, you know, Pearson, our crack producer, our all-pro producer, always running the controls, knows how to run all this stuff to make sure it goes smoothly. And so a couple things. Now... I think the important thing for everybody to remember about Hard Knocks offseason is that, as Joe Shane has said, he told Albert Breer from Sports Illustrated in a for a column that came out two weeks ago, and Joe was very astute in making this observation. The Hard Knocks during training camp and the Hard Knocks during the season is an edited compilation of stuff that happens within that previous week. There is a very short time from the time the stuff is actually filmed, then chopped up and edited, and then spit out onto the airwaves. So you have time as part of the context of the show. This is the first ever Hard Knocks offseason, which lends itself to a very different dynamic. Because you don't know exactly, and I know that during the course of the program, they do flash up a screen with a Chiron indicating the date of some of the conversations and and things that were taking place, including the combine. But I think what's important to note is that you truly don't know specifically the time for a lot of the comments when they occurred. Now, for example, 
I remember being at the Giants' 100th season celebration over at MSG, and they showed a preview of the program. And Shane Bowen, the brand-new defensive coordinator who came in in February, was quoted in a clip. Pearson, you probably remember this. He was quoted in a clip talking about uh, the kind of defense that he was going to play, the type of scheme that he wanted to play. And then he talked about how intrigued he was by Ryder Anderson and Boogie Basham and also talked about how he was going to hopefully employ Isaiah Simmons if they were able to bring him back. Well, I remember seeing the you know tweets that night and the next day. Several folks were immediately popping that stuff up right away. And, oh, this is, this is what Bowen's going to do with his defense. Well, here's the problem. The clip was, was taken in February right after he first got here. Things have changed since then. The Giants signed some free agents. The Giants went through a draft process. And, oh, by the way, at the time that Bowen made the comment about the scheme he wanted to use, the Giants did not have a Pro Bowl pass rusher in Brian Burns. They subsequently made a deal for Brian Burns, which if I am Shane Bowen, I'm not only throwing a party, but I'm also tweaking whatever thoughts I had about this defense now that I've got another play toy to use. So this is why you've got to be extremely careful because they have taken, I guess it's from late January, early February probably, up until minicamp. And they've taken all this stuff and they have compressed it. And what you're seeing now is on a time delay, which is not necessarily allowing you to take a complete and full context of some of what you're seeing and hearing. That's why I think when Cliff called, he was talking about Dable saying we need to add pieces to. And, and, was, that, still, was that from an and earlier I think clip? It, and I think it was months ago that he was saying that. Well, then you know what? I just got duped and fooled into a into a trap with that one. If if Cliff, if that's what you were talking about, if you were talking about a hard knocks comment, then I think Pearson is right. Yeah, I could be wrong, but to, I'm pretty sure. To put sure. that into context. Now, if it's something that Dable said a couple of weeks ago before they, they broke at the end of minicamp, and I don't remember if it was or not, you'd have to, again, date the comment. I would go back to what I said to you earlier about my potential yellow flags for the depth chart on this roster. Um, I may have answered it differently. In fact, I would have answered it differently if I knew the, the uh, comment was taken from a hard knocks clip. For sure. Still a good conversation, though. Well, sure. Well, we try. We try to give you information on this program. That's what it's all about. So in any event, I think that's the most important thing for everybody to realize is that even though they will occasionally put a a date up on the screen for, for the Hard Knocks program, you know, not everything that was said is said particularly, you know, in the context of now, of where we are now. It's said in the context of maybe that time. And so you have to process in your head and pull back the calendar and start thinking about, well, what was going on at the time? Who did they have at the time, right? And and that's all part of, I guess, the, the mystery or the puzzle that now you have to unravel as you're watching the show because Joe Shane himself, again, quoted to Albert Breer, said, this is just so different now because everything that people are seeing has already played out. And now you're looking at it through a lens from the back door after after some of this stuff has changed, been morphed, been tweaked. Hey, maybe in some instances... Some of the stuff was was totally, totally uh, thrown out and and wound up leading the team into a completely different direction. So I just apprise you of that in case, uh, you know, I think we might have mentioned it at one point right before we left for the break. But I want to bring that to your attention again because Hard Knocks Episode 3 airs tomorrow, 9, a. M., uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Max. And again, as you're watching, 
I don't know how much of that stuff um, is pliable based on, oh, applicable is the better word, applicable based on the context uh, of the clips. In any event, 201-939-4513 is our phone number. We got only about a minute left, so I don't think we're going to be able to get to any quick phone calls. Let me just see quickly if somebody hit us up on Twitter at the hashtag Giants Chat. And uh, again, remember, the Giants Foundation uh, is uh, going to be the benefactor of the Giants run and walk with Giants legends. Again, the 5K race and kids run presented by Quest is Saturday, September 7th at 9 a.m. at MetLife Stadium. And you can register now at Giants.com uh, slash 5K. Quick look at Giants chat before we close it out for the day. And we invite you to come back for tomorrow's program. I do see, uh, oh, Allie Hubbard saying she loves the Pro Football Hall of Fame busts that were at the theater at Madison Square Garden uh, for the 100th season celebration, of course, folks. And remember, too, if you didn't see the show uh, on MSG, the one-hour highlighted uh, edited version, they did slice up all the different sections of the Giants' 100th season celebration that was at the Garden. They did slice it up. I think it's in five parts, Pearson. Is that right? It's in five parts on Giants.com. So uh, don't forget, you could go there. It's well worth your time. It was a two-hour and 45-minute presentation, and it was dynamite. So it is still up there on the archive, and if you folks want uh, want to get a chance to, to view it, please, by all means, do it. Well, that's going to do it for uh, today's edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. It is part of Giants Platforms Everywhere and Giants.com slash podcasts. Again, we'll be with you on Tuesday, live at 12.30 p.m. to take your live phone calls as rookies report for the first time preparing for the 2024 season. And we'll also be previewing another one of the New York Giants regular season foes. I'm Paul Tatino. We'll see you then.